Best Practices Expo. If you missed the first expo, I encourage you to take the time to watch it. There were really some great practices shared and we have recorded the sessions. Um, they're not necessarily high quality recordings, but they will give you the information that you need. And we will record all three of the sessions. We had great feedback from the first expo and in, attendees seemed to really enjoy the opportunity to learn from their peers. So it makes me real excited about this second one as well. Kudos to Anita Villarreal and Jaime at TEA who came up with this idea of doing the expo. So kudos to them. My name is Terry Stafford and I'm the coordinator of the Title I Part A Parent and Family Engagement Statewide Initiative. And it's so good to see all of your bright and shiny faces this morning at 8.30 in the morning. So I'm pretty impressed. I'm choosing to believe that someday, 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 that it's going to return back to normal, whatever normal is going to look like. I'm so excited to see that each time we have the expo, our numbers are growing. We had over 600 registered for the first one, and we have over 700 registered today, and we're trying to get everybody in just as quickly as absolutely possible. And again, I know that you guys are Zoom weary and so are we. Our team likes to call it Zoom doom. Um, so I'm gonna share a couple of funny pictures with you so you can relate. And for those of you that aren't on the screen and you have it off, then I'll know which picture is you. And for those of you that are showing your gorgeous faces today, we'll know which picture is you. So Skip's gonna put up the first picture. Drum roll. Ba -da 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 -da. If it comes up here quick, then we'll do it. If not, we'll move on. Okay. We're just going to move on and not worry about the pictures. They were just nice little cartoons anyway to kind of get us ready for the day. Um, one of the cartoons, I'll just go ahead and share it with you. It said, do you want us to... Go ahead and schedule another Zoom meeting, or do you just want us to hit ourselves in the hammer, our head in the ham with a hammer for about 15 times? And so that's kind of how we feel sometimes. Um, I do know that the screen has some blinking going on right now, and that is simply because we are trying to get in all of the other people. When you're trying to enter 700 folks, it just takes some time and it kind of overloads the system a little bit. So I just appreciate you guys bearing with us. I'd like to introduce my team again, in case you weren't here at the first one. We've got Skip Forsythe, who's been with me since Moses was a baby. But the new ones are Matthew Chavez, Katie Chavez, they're not kin, nor are they married. And Shannon Lang, excited to have new members on our team. And I just can't wait for you guys to get to know them and to meet them face to face. They're so ready to begin to make those connections. And we just know someday it's going to happen. Because this audience is so large, we have everyone muted because it's just impossible to keep up with it with this many people. Um, and so you will not be able to unmute yourselves. Um, we're certainly not trying to be rude and hope you guys don't feel that way. We just want to make sure that the session runs smoothly and that we don't experience any unintended confusion. But we certainly want to address your questions. So if you have a question for us or the presenter, please write us in the chat room. We will have a Q&A at the end of each of the sessions, but if we see that the same question just keeps coming up over and over, then we'll stop in the middle and address that question. Also, if you have a group of folks who are watching in one room together, but maybe only one registered, that's fine. But we would like for you to mail us a list of attendees so we can add them to the overall roster. We just want to get an accurate account. At this time, I'm going to have very quickly have Shannon give us a few things that you need to be aware of. Good morning. I'm glad everyone's here to join us this morning. Um, a few things, and some of you may have already heard me say this a couple of times, but for those of you who just joined us, 
um, with almost 700 um, people that have enrolled. It's a little hard to keep up with everyone who actually um, has shown up. So if you need a certificate um, for this training, we encourage you to change your screen name in Zoom. Um, when it Zoom, when we finish, it kicks back a name and some of those names are nicknames or initials or sometimes even phone numbers and we cannot match those to the people who have um, enrolled or your email to give you credit. So if you need credit for this course, please consider going. You can hover over your name um, in the participant box or in the top of your screen, there should be some dots you can hover over and change your screen name to your first name and your last name. And then that gives us the opportunity to find you and give you credit for today's sessions. Um, and that's all I have. So, so glad you're here. Thank you, Shannon. We want to make sure that you get what you need. So certainly follow the directions as she gave them to you and we'll take care of the rest. At the end of the first presentation, there will be a 15 minute break and then we'll start the second presentation. It's a pleasure to introduce the first school representing this morning and this school is from Region 16 area. They're from Groover ISD and representing today are Neely Arms and Wade Calloway, the superintendent there at Groover ISD. Groover ISD is a rural school in the Panhandle and what they've done is they found lots of innovative ways to involve their parents and families and they've been able to do this without a lot of Title I funds. Our little rural schools, as you know, they don't get much Title I money, so they have to be very creative in the way that they do their parent and family engagement. So sit back, relax, get ready to learn new techniques and strategies for working with your families. If you're not from a rural school, fear not. You're going to learn strategies that you can use at whether you're at a rural school, an urban school, or a suburban school. So we know that you've got lots to learn. So join me in giving a warm wave of welcome to Groover. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Stafford. Uh, my name is Neely Arms. Um, I am the Family and Community Engagement Coordinator at Groover ISD, and I just want to... If you're uh, on, you can begin. Can just you hear me okay? Yourself. I am unmuted. Can everybody hear me? Yes, you are good to go. Okay, yeah. perfect. So um, first, I just want to lead into the fact that uh, I am just a country girl from Texas, and, um, you know, I, I'm very real. And when doing this presentation, I want you to know that um, it's no different than if, if you were sitting in my shoes doing this presentation. So um, by no means are we perfect and by no means am I perfect, especially when, when it comes to presenting. Uh, so I just wanted to come on common ground with you and know that we're just gonna share what we do, what works. And, and we've already learned so much from the previous presenters. Um, so, you know, learning from each other is kind of the goal here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm, I'm not the most uh, technologically sane person, but however, I try to get the job done. So I'm going to go ahead and get this presentation rolling. All right. So, all right. So I want to give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, and the reason I want to do this is because I want you to understand the lens that I look through. I think it's important to really know who you are and your experience of what you do, uh, because how you attack projects and how you look at problem solving, um, that's going to depend on the lens that you look through and kind of your past experiences. So I just want to share a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Denton, Texas, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, graduated from Denton High School. Uh, with that comes an experience uh, with large school systems. So Denton is, is pretty large. I graduated with about 400, um, kind of a far stretch from what we have here at Groover. Uh, and then I went to, on to Tarleton State University, um, have a, a degree in psychology and animal science. And I know that those two are completely related. Um, but we, um, again, you know, showing my background a little bit kind of shows you the lens that I look through. I'm also a mom of two junior high students here at Groover. I'm the head softball coach as well. 
Um, so sports is a big thing for me. Um, you'll hear, you know, maybe Coach Callaway call me Coach Arms. That's my 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 main name here at Groover ISD is Coach Arms. So uh, I wear many hats, uh, I, I, as most of you probably do that are from a, a small school system. So uh, my, my work experience is really in public relations. I've got a lot of marketing and sales experience as well as leadership training. So when I'm talking to you about some of the things that we do and how we engage our community, how we promote, um, I, I really do come from a marketing sales background and, uh, and how we can you know, grasp people's attention and, and getting everybody involved. So one of the biggest things I get, because I'm from Denton, I can relate to this, but when we say, well, we're from Groover, well, where, where in the world is Groover, Texas? We get that all the time. Uh, my husband was born and raised here, so uh, it's home for him. But Groover is in the tip, tip top of the panhandle of Texas. We are not far from the Oklahoma border. Um, we are a small rural town full of feedlots. Uh, it's a farming community. Um, and you know why this is important is really to understand again, just our population of who we're dealing with when it comes to the community and when it comes to our students. Uh, we have a lot of students that do live in town in our small town of population around 1200. It does fluctuate just a little bit, but it's usually around 1200. Um, we have students that live in town, uh, but we also have students and families that live out, uh, you know, 20, 20 miles, 20, 30 miles out in the country, maybe on a feedlot or on a farm. So, um, you know, there is a range there when it comes to how we approach things in dealing with our, our families and with our students. So a little bit about our schools um, here on the, the same, I would say, campus or ground, we're all in walking distance of all three of our schools. Uh, we have our elementary, which is pre-K through fourth grade. Uh, we have our junior high, um, which is a little bit unique. It was different than the way I grew up, but we actually have fifth grade through eighth grade in our junior high. And then our high school is a tra traditional a ninth through 12th. Um, again, all of these campuses, as well as our business office, is all um, on the same property within walking distance. They do have their own buildings, so things are separate. Um, however, you know, the communication between the two, between the buildings and the campuses is, is, is convenient. So when I talk to you about how we do things and why we do things, I do want you to keep that into consideration. Um, I know coming from small school districts that you probably have, you know, similar campuses where you can walk and communicate with each other um, when you have events you're able to incorporate all three of your schools because you're there in one location. But maybe, maybe you're not set up that way. Maybe you're in a, you know, a farther geographical distance. Um, so again, I really just want to stress the emphasis on when we explain how we do things, um, it may be unique. And, and so I want you to be inspired. I want you to uh, maybe put a spin on the way we do things. That way you don't feel pressured. Like, and you're going to say to yourself, wow, we can't do that. Well, our, our town can't do that. Well, yes, you can. You can do it in your way. You can do it with a spin on it and using maybe this framework. So uh, when I do trainings, I like to tell people, don't be a chameleon. Don't try to turn colors to, to whoever's talking to you. Don't be just like them, but maybe try to have, try to have your own color. So you see our student numbers here. Again, we're, we're pretty small when it comes to, you know, to our students, but also, but also pretty even across our campuses. So taking a look at our demographics, again, just setting the stage um, for, you know, what we're, what we're doing here. Um, we have a pretty, uh, pretty even split when it comes to ethnic distribution. Um, we have, you know, 51% uh, white Caucasian and 47% um, Hispanic population. Um, there is a less than 2% of other um, but when it comes to putting things out in native language and dealing and communicating with our families, um, we do have to make sure that we are uh, very 50-50 split when it comes to, you know, making sure everything is bilingual um, in, in, in their native language. That is a goal here in our communication. I mean, kind of see uh, more demographics about our disadvantaged as well as our special POPs. So our mission here at Groover ISD um, the mission of Groover ISD is to provide exceptional educational opportunities to every child in a safe and nurturing environment that will produce responsible, productive, and successful citizens. Um, you know, why this is important and why I really want to emphasize those words there is, is because 
this mission statement is not only ingrained in the traditions of Groover uh, as far as the school system is concerned, but it also is ingrained in the community. Um, you know, you see a lot of community members here that were raised here. They graduated from Groover, um, you know, and whether they're whether they're a native here to Groover or whether they're a transplant is what we like to call them, which is what I am. Um, you really do grasp onto this idea of, of this mission statement. And it really is about, you know, that nurturing environment and also producing successful citizens. We, we're about the long run. Um, we're not about the now. You know, we, we do focus on the now because the now is what gets you to the long run. However, you know, really producing well-rounded individuals here is, is our goal. And it does take a village. It takes a village um, with the staff members. It takes a village with the community and everything that, that uh, goes on here. So I wanna to introduce you to our team. And when I say team, um, again, you have to remember that I'm a coach. And so I, I do look at team mentality when it comes to doing things. Um, yes, I am the, uh, I call myself the face coordinator. So when you hear me say face, uh, just, a, just a shortened way of saying family and community engagement coordinator. Um, that tends to be a mouthful for me. So I will shorten that down to face. However, because I have that title um, and there are job descriptions that fall under that, I, we do utilize a team here when it comes to family and uh, community involvement. Um, you're looking at you know, our administrative team right here. Of course, we have uh, Mr. Wade Calloway, our superintendent, you'll hear from him in just a little bit. And then we have our three uh, campus principals, Amber Holland, Lexi Glass, and Kimberly Conyers. Um, again, I'm going to stress the fact of looking through that lens, how, why, how and why we do things. The combined experience between these four individuals, um, ranging from classroom teachers to uh, certified counselors to, you know, coaches. So how we approach things comes from that mentality and that experience. And I really do encourage you, um, maybe you, maybe you're a coordinator or maybe you are um, just the, the person responsible. Maybe you're a counselor and you're, you're the person responsible for um, the family and engagement. And maybe you feel a little overwhelmed. And, and what, what we do here is we try to really distribute. We try to find people that are good at what they do um, and then we're able to give them jobs and, and tasks that they can uh, execute, you know, properly and efficiently. So, again, uh, I love this quote by Harry Truman that says it is amazing what you can do, what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. And it gets that team mentality, uh, again, when it comes to to attacking communication. Uh, the rest of our team here, of course, uh, there's myself, and then we have Miss Holly McLean. You'll get to hear from her as well in a little bit. She is our Director of Technology and Instruction. Um, she is a huge behind the scenes, you know, when it comes to our websites, when it comes to sending out text, which we'll go over in a bit of how we communicate. Um, but she does come from, again, she has a background, uh, not only in technology, but she has a background as far as being a classroom teacher. Um, she's also a parent. So she likes to put herself in other shoes when it comes to how do, how do we need to communicate? How do parents want to hear from us? Um, how do community members want to hear from us? And so um, she's able to do that because of her background. We have uh, Mrs. Kimberly Irwin. She's a high school uh, CTE teacher. She has been here for uh, 18 years and done everything from web, webmaster um, to technology. Uh, she's worn a lot of hats here and again, um, you know, she's a huge asset when it comes to that, that engagement. Uh, she's also head of the yearbook. And so um, we have a huge relationship, or I do especially have a huge relationship with our yearbook staff, uh, because I can't get out and go because of the several hats that I wear in the classroom uh, with my softball team. Um, you know, my time is limited to what I can do as far as on my own two feet. And so she uh, has an entire yearbook staff that goes out and collects pictures at all of our events. Um, they're, they're involved in, in, in recording that stuff for the yearbook, and we share that as well. So that is something that I highly recommend if you're not already doing is, um, you know, build a relationship with the person that's in charge of your yearbook. Um, because that is an actual recording of everything that, that goes on at your, at your uh, campus. And then, of course, we have Coach Keith Malden. He, again, is really involved in technology, um, technology support. He's a coach um, and has, because of his technology background, 
he is able to uh, have some responsibilities when it comes to our school apps, our team apps that we use for sports. And, um, and then he also teaches our drone class, which is pretty amazing that we'll kind of touch on a little bit later about that. So what I want to really you to take away from this is that um, I, I truly believe that everybody has gifts. Everybody has, you know, again, like I said before, job experience. So, so recognizing what, what people are good at and, and maybe, maybe there's someone on your campus that has a gift or is really good at social media. Um, you know, social media is its own beast. And so you kind of have to know the ins and outs to really operate that properly. Maybe you have someone that's really good at, you know, texting or communicating. So just thinking outside of the box and, and reevaluating, you know, the people that you work with. And maybe, you know, there's lots of people that, that love to use their gifts to contribute to things. And again, uh, communication is key. So when you're running a team, uh, I can't preach this enough to my softball girls, but you have to communicate, uh, you know, within your team as well as, you know, pushing that communication to students and, and to the community. So here at Groover, we, we take a very um, traditional, but also progressive approach when it comes to how and why we do things. Um, I put these definitions up here of traditional and progressive because I want you to really understand just the basic meaning of that and traditional existing in or as a part of, of a tradition long established. Um, that long established really resonated with me when, when really creating this presentation because here in Groover, um, things are very long established. Uh, sometimes when we try to move into the progressive ways of doing things, we'll get a little bit of kickback um, just because, well, that's the way we've always done things. And, and sometimes that's an okay thing. Sometimes the way you've always done it is okay, um, but you still have to grow and you still have to evolve. So finding that balance between traditional and progressive it, is key in, in how you evolve and how you do things. Um, you know, that interpersonal approach I feel like can really combine both. And, I, and as we get through this, this presentation, I, I really want to kind of you to keep that in mind of we do take an interpersonal approach in everything that we do, um, but it is a progressive and a traditional way of doing things and, and how we communicate. So our community um, involvement is huge. And again, uh, we, we are unique and, and I can't tell you enough when I have family members come and visit me here, because again, I'm from the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is this is Mayberry. I feel like I'm, you know, almost in a Hallmark movie. And, uh, and yes, it, it does feel like that sometimes. Now, of course, just like any small town or big town, we have our issues, we have our, we have our problems and we have ways that we can improve. Um, but we are a very unique community. Um, so again, how we do things may not look exactly the way you may do things, but I feel like all of these all of these ideas can absolutely be implemented in your town as far as involvement goes. Um, this is more on the side of traditional uh, as far as, and you'll see on the left of my screen, this, this will be a consistent uh, throughout this presentation um, because I wanna drive home these points and, and it is building relationships, it's building community, uh, it's creating in, interests and investments, uh, it's outreach, and of course, I can't say communication enough. Um, now, when I say creating interest and investments, um, some of you might, might kind of raise an ear to that and think, well, you know, what does that mean? Um, is that financial? Is that what, is, what does that look like? And, and when I focus on uh, interest and investments, I'm looking at it from an emotional standpoint. Again, you, you're talking to someone with a psychology background. Um, when you have the heartstrings tied to something, uh, people are dedicated. When you have someone emotionally invested in something, uh, they're going to prioritize it. They're going to show up, basically. So when I talk about creating those interests and investments, I'm looking at it from a fan perspective of someone that is emotionally uh, invested in something. We encourage at all of our events, we, we promote, uh, we encourage that community involvement. Um, here are a few pictures of some of our past events that we've done, um, ranging from our uh, veterans here that we had a, a veterans assembly with with a special special speaker excuse me that came in and our auditorium was packed um, we of course had our student body in there but we also had community members and these fine gentlemen that you see here are our local veterans that were honored during that day and, and it was pretty neat to see the kids uh, especially the elementary kids that have seen these gentlemen before in town and maybe they just thought that it was just another old man um, but this really recognized and tied our student body 
to the, the people that live in our community. Uh, when they walk by them in the grocery store, they know that that's a veteran. And so um, really recognizing community members to our student body is a big thing for us as well. Again, it creates that relationship. Um, down here, we have some events that we've done in the past for a Halloween carnival. I'll kind of touch on that a little bit later. Um, here is another a kind of a special thing that, you know, sports is a huge uh, thing here. I, I, and I'm sure those of you that, that are familiar with Groover, you understand that. Um, sports is a driving force here. Um, there are some that may or may not agree with, with that as far as the effectiveness of sports or where it should be prioritized. But we've, what we've chosen to do is because it, it is a fact here, we've chosen to optimize it. We've chosen, okay, so how can we use that um, to create that engagement? How can we use that to create those emotional investments to where when we have an academic recognition award ceremony that the house is packed just like it would be packed for a football game. And so I will touch on that a little bit later, but this was a send off that we did for our cross country girls that went to state. We had a motivational um, speaker come in that is local and she is a past athlete. And again, it's just, it's creating that relationship between the student body and, and our community. And then here was a, was a quick uh, elementary uh, field trip to our local bank. And so um, they were able to kind of, again, get out there. Now we, we do live in a close uh, geographic town. So those, those elementary kids were able to walk to the bank as well as be able to walk uh, to the post office. So I'm gonna kind of break it down a little bit um, by elementary or, or by campus of how, of how we do things. And so just to kind of get an idea of how we, we do things district wide, but we also like to do specifics and how we engage our parents and family. And of course we have our traditional open house. Again, I think tradition is, is important. Um, I'm a huge face-to-face -face person. Now, uh, obviously with COVID and, and with some of the adjustments and safety precautions that we've have having to take, we have had to adjust the way that we've done things. Um, but we still do a traditional open house. We've just had to uh, schedule um, by last name different uh, groups coming through as to low down to, to lower your numbers, excuse me, to lower your numbers on the amount of people per campus. Um, but everybody still shows up. They show up, you know, with their masks on and we social distance. But again, that face to face interaction at open house is is key as you know, as far as uh, creating that commitment and letting parents just see what's going on. We still have meet the teacher um, and we still have majority of these um, holiday celebrations. They just, they do look a little different now because of COVID. Down here on the screen to the right, um, you'll see these, these fine young ladies that are dressed up in their Halloween costumes. This was actually a recent event uh, for this past Halloween, just a, a week or so ago. And they were able to still do their, their spooky stories. And, uh, but we just, we broadcasted it live on Facebook. So I will kind of go into that a little bit later on to, to show you how and why we're able to do those things from a technical side. Um, but again, I think that you have to just adjust. You have to, to modify, but not cancel your events because these events are important to these kids and they're, they're important to the engagement of the parents as well. So moving on a little bit, again, uh, touching back on these, these field trips involving the community, tying in these relationships, letting these kids know um, how important their community is and how important um, these people are. Because we are a small town, uh, they may see uh, Mr. Tabeast here, who is one of our bankers, who is also a father of a student here. Um, they may see him as, as a dad, but then they get to show up in his work environment and see that he's actually, you know, important role in our community. So it's opening these kids' eyes to, to what goes on, as well as uh, creating the investment of of our local businesses into these kids that are growing up in their own town. So we've had our volunteer uh, fire department come out and do a demonstration. And then we take kids out on field trips to our local farms um, to be able to get exposed to uh, kind of our local economy and kind of what goes on here in Groover. So kind of advancing on now to our junior high, uh, things still look, look the same. Um, but we also modified to that campus and of course the age group and what we're doing as far as involving the community and involving the kids. Um, over here to the right, you'll see just another field trip and we're going to touch a little bit on our farm scholarship a little bit later, but these were the kids taking a field trip out to our farm scholarship. Um, again, we, we promote sports, but we promote everything else as well. You're going to hear me say this again and again uh, from, from our marketing background. We promote, 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 
um, and, and we we share, share, share. That that's what we do. We try to put things out to where people are encouraged to come. It's not one text. It's not one flyer. Um, we make a big deal about it here because if you can make a big deal about it here and, and buy in your staff uh, here and get them excited about things, the community and the family is going to buy in as well. People want to be where people are excited. And so if we're super excited about our UIL academics, um, we're going to have family and community members excited. This is an awards banquet for our UIL uh, academics um, last year. And as you can see here, the, the house was full. The house was full of parents and community members coming to just celebrate those kids and their academic achievements. Um, down here again, we have our, our Halloween carnival. We were unable to do that this year because of COVID. Um, this was uh, in years past where we had our NJHS, uh, National Junior Honor Society, be able to run these events. And, and I do think that that's important. When you put on events and when you put on things that involve community, it's also involving the student body to where they are also invested in, in working it, teaching them how to put on a successful event, how to market that event. Um, you can use that as an educational tool as well uh, when it comes to the community. And then they get a chance to, to talk to the community members as they pass by their booth or as they engage with them. So I'm gonna really focus on high school. Um, something that I know that there's been a need for uh, when I was asked to do this, this presentation, um, something that Groover is known for is our engagement at the high school level. And I know that there are some school districts that really, that maybe struggle with that. You struggle with what can we do at the high school level? We just don't have an, we don't have a parent involvement. We don't have, you know, big crowds coming out when it comes to educational things. So I want to kind of show you a little bit and spend some, some, some really uh, important time on this high school level, because you have to really understand, okay, so what drives people in your community? What's that motivator for people to show up? And, and sometimes it is sports. Um, you know, so if you can build off of that and utilize that, um, I, I strongly encourage it. And, and so what you see here is we're going to kind of focus a little bit on the sports and then how we, we utilize that to drive that momentum to our other uh to our other assemblies, our educational assemblies, our parent meetings, and how we can still get people to show up. And I really focus on, again, that investment. If you create a fan in a kid, if you create a following in, in a group, in a student body, that following or that fan is going to show up no matter where that kid is. If that kid is involved in theater, if that kid is involved in art, if that kid is involved in academic UIL, um, the, the fans show up. So what we try to do is we try to create that personal relationship between the community and parents and the kids to where they are now emotionally invested and they want to show up no matter what kind of event we have. So at the top here, we have what's called Meet the Hounds. Um, I know schools do something similar, but at the beginning of every school year and, and really every transition of of the seasons. Um, so this was, uh, you know, for your fall sports, football, cross country, we had our cheerleaders, we had our junior high football and cross country at this event, where we, you know, introduce each kid, we tell them what grade they're in, um, we, you know, obviously what team they're on, and they step out and they wave to the crowd. You're going to see over here, this was a picture from one of the past events, and we had people, you know, people were also social distancing a little bit, but we had lots of families um, that were engaging in this. They were excited to be there uh, to watch these kids. We also have what's called send-offs, and so these are, you know, when we have sporting events, Groover's been very blessed to get to go to, you know, playoff games and state, state tournaments and things like that. We make a huge deal out of that. We send out massive amounts of communications to the community and, and encourage people to show up for these send-offs. Um, to be able to support these kids. The kids see the support from the community. But if you can see here, I don't know if, if it's uh, big on your screen or not, but you know, we had a bunch of cowboys show up with their, with their Groover High School flags that were racing the bus. Now, again, I, I get that you may not be able to do this in your town with a stampede of horses and flags, um, but there are ways to, to still line the streets with cars, honk your horns, make flags and signs, encourage the community to show up and, and be excited for those kids.
And again, like I said before, we have special speakers come in as well as we did here for um, cross country. We also focus on, you know, we make a big deal out of our band concerts, our holiday events. Uh, we have lots of people that show up for that. That's been a longstanding tradition um, that we do. And again, we don't, we don't want to ever get away from those longstanding traditions. As we do new things like send-offs, like motivational speakers, um, we don't ever want to discredit the traditions because your older generations that have been around your town or your community for a long time, um, they appreciate those longstanding traditions and those events. So we still put a lot of focus on the traditional Christmas concert, um, on the traditional, you know, spring concerts that we have and some of those, those events. So I, I, I encourage you as you uh, get out of the box and think progressively and, and add new things to what you do. Don't take tradition for granted because the, the like I said, your community is, is attached to your traditions. Um, long list here of, of things that we do. I'll touch on some of this in a little bit. Um, but again, something that we do from an educational standpoint is we do have these CT, the CTE demonstrations with our drone class. Um, during these send-offs, we actually will, will record this with our drones. And then we're able to post that to our social media sites and tie those in. So the people that did not show up for those send-offs, they're able to then watch it uh, from a really cool perspective that's put together by our CTE program. And then either that makes them excited about getting to show up for the next one, or they just they now become a fan of our technology group and say, wow, it's really cool that that Groover High School is able to, to do drones and, and make videos to promote to promote those events. Um, you know, moving on to, to a little something, some unique things that we do that, that I think um, is very doable in other school districts and small towns. And, and that is, of course, you know, focusing on community service, uh, engaging, engaging your FCCLA, your FFA, your ag groups, um, your elective, your electives, even your classes. We have lots of, uh, this was from a class competition that we created uh, within our high school, which, which class could gather the most canned goods to donate. Um, you know, involving charity and community service within, within your, your classes is important. Um, yes, we, because Groover is so competitive, uh, we have to make it a competition <laughs> between our classes. So, um, but yeah, do what you got to do to, to get that involvement, to get that excitement with, within those kids. Because what they did is they were able to sur way surpass their goal of 800 items that they were able to donate to our local food banks. And, and they were excited about that. They were able to personally donate that and see how they were giving back to that community. Over here to my left, um, this is something that we do at prom. Now, uh, I, we promote this. This has been a longstanding tradition, but I do encourage you, if you've never done something like this with your prom, um, this is such a cool event that I think that is so doable. It does take promoting. It does take consistency, uh, but we make a huge deal out of prom uh, to the point where the kids that are arriving, this is, these are pictures taken from arrivals at prom, and it literally looks like showing up for the Oscars. Uh, the, the entire community shows up, they take pictures, they line the streets, uh, huge crowds, the, the young girls from the elementaries, uh, the junior high girls, they show up, some of them even dressed up um, to, to dress up like their favorite senior or their favorite high schooler. Uh, it's a really cool event that we've promoted. Um, it has grown to the point that our local community members, members donate their vintage cars. Um, they also donate their their big semis, whether it's a grain truck that they use for farming, um, you know, they donate their, their spiffed up Jeep to where they allow these kids to show up in style. And there is a parent that is um, driving these cars and parking them. Uh, the, the student body gets in them down the street and then they are able to just create a line down our street. They drive up to the drop off point. We take pictures, have a photo op. Um, and then, of course, you know, we promote this in our newsletters and our social media. And it really is a cool thing that involves the community, you know, and, and the kids. The kids really find it exciting and it, um, it makes them really want to get involved. OK, so I'm going to kind of change gears on you a little bit. And I, again, towards the end of this presentation, if you have questions about some of these events and how we do things and the details of those, um, I absolutely am open to questions at the end of this. And we can, we can kind of jump back to a certain uh, event if you something caught your eye of how and why we do things. Uh, but right now, I kind of want to focus on something that is, again, unique to our community. 
Um, but it's something that I truly feel like you can implement in your own uh, in your own district, in your own town. Um, because we are a farming community, and um, we have lots of farming families here, you know, and, and the farms are tied into the feedlots. Um, we have built something called our farm scholarship, and I'm going to introduce Mr. Wade Calloway here in a second to really give you the details um, and the ins and outs of this. Um, but what I want you to keep in mind is because I don't want you to shut out the idea um, of, oh, well, we can't do that. We're not a farming community. Well, what businesses drive your community? Um, what, what market is in your community? How can you develop a relationship with the local businesses in your community? Because I, because I really guarantee you, especially when it comes from small towns, most small towns have a heart for giving. They have a heart for, for wanting to be involved. They have a heart for wanting to help kids out. And, and what it does is it not only creates, um, it, it creates relationships on both ends, but it creates that investment. Uh, it creates that investment in these businesses where if they are contributing to the education and the scholarships of these kids, they kind of want to know their journey through high school. They want to see, oh, did they graduate? You know, can I help them out? How else can I help them out? So it just creates this really cool uh, snowball effect. So brainstorm, make you some notes about what, what businesses are out there, what, what drives your community as far as econom uh, economics go. Um, and then how can you spin that to where and ask and invite these businesses to get involved? So uh, Mr. Calloway, I'm going to go ahead and invite you. This is um, our superintendent, Mr. Wade Calloway. A uh, phenomenal human being. He drives this ship, and uh, I'm going to have him jump on and kind of explain what the ins and outs of this scholarship. All right. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Uh, buenos dias. Ben bienvenidos. Uh, appreciate everybody being on board uh, this morning. Uh, as Coach Arm said, uh, my name is Wade Calloway. And uh, I am a superintendent and I am blessed to be here because we have a fantastic group of, of folks here and a, and a great community. Uh, just a little bit about my background as well. I, I'm, I'm an old basketball coach. Uh, I grew up in a small town as well, uh, but I was fortunate to play college basketball uh, for a guy named Mark Adams, who's a, the associate head coach at Tech now. But I, at one point he was the head coach at uh, Texas Pan America. So I've been down to the bottom of the state. Um, when I was the head boys coach at Caprock, Emerald Caprock in 5A, uh, about 75% uh, Hispanic. Uh, we played a number of El Paso teams. So I've, I've been out that way as well. And uh, Caprock was, was a great experience for me. Uh, they, they put me in uh, what they called repeat biology. So it was all the students that uh, had failed previously. They were all at risk. Uh, I've got a lot of great stories. Um, but those are the those are the really the type of kids that I that I am attracted to and drawn to. Um, anyway, I end up here uh, as the boys basketball coach, and then individuals left, and they would go, "Hey, do you want to be the junior high principal?" Or, "Hey, do you want to be?" So, I, I was never going to be the superintendent, much less a principal. But but here I am, and, and I'm grateful for it. So, uh, this is my third year as superintendent Groover. And we do have a unique um, program called the Farm Scholarship. Uh, just a little bit of history. A gentleman named Carl Nielsen, uh, he was born in Denmark in 1879. He moved uh, to the United States in 1901, moved to Groover. He was a bachelor farmer. He lived with his sister. And in the 1970s, uh, before he passed away, he donated a section of land to the district. A section of land is 640 acres. Uh, and we did various and sundry things with, with, that, with that property. Uh, for example, we would lease it to local ranchers and they would put their cattle. Uh, we'd generate about $25,000 a year. We could buy textbooks, you know, laptops, things like that. Uh, we talked about selling it. We could probably get about a million dollars for that uh, that land. But a, a previous, I really can't take any credit. I'm just trying not to mess things up here. But uh, a previous superintendent and some local farmers just got together and said, I think we can maximize that land a little better. 
And so they had the idea to, uh, to drill a water well, which we did. We uh, put up irrigation and it's a circle. So if you're, if you're ever flying in an airplane and you see green circles down, that's, that's called a pivot. And so the, the uh, irrigation system is, is a center pivot and it just goes around in a circle and that's, it waters everything. Um, so that's what we have. So of the 640 acres, we are able to, uh, to utilize 440 acres. We have local farmers that uh, donate equipment, time, and we plant a cornfield. We, we plant a, a corn crop uh, each year in the spring. And then about this time, probably next week, we're going to harvest it. Uh, believe it or not, we were shut down three days last week because of a blizzard, a snowstorm. Uh, so uh, it's a little too wet right now to cut corn, but next week they plan on cutting it. Um, and it, it's really remarkable. The, uh, the seed is donated. So uh, local individuals can buy a uh, you know, bag of seed if they're not a farmer. Uh, we have uh, the, the fertilizer donated, uh, the equipment donated. Uh, when the, uh, the crop is ready for harvest, we harvest it and they harvest it for free. Some of the overhead uh, usually involved in farming is storage of the corn. Uh, we have, we have uh, individuals that donate the storage for free. Uh, as Coach Arms said, we have a number of feedlots in the area. The feedlots pre-purchase the feed at a premium cost uh, or a price, about $3.80, plus they add about a 50 cent basis. So we're looking at about $4.30 a bushel. Now we get about 125,000 bushels from that 440 acres. So you look at around four dollars and thirty cents times one hundred twenty five thousand you know you're making over a half a million dollars a year on a corn crop of 440 acres uh, the overhead is what kills farmers the, the the machinery the diesel the water the storage the transportation to the feedlot which is also donated uh, so when we are able to eliminate the vast majority of that overhead uh, we, we keep 80% of that half a million dollars, uh, which is really remarkable. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, a bushel is about six dry gallons. So the corn crop makes about 750,000 gallons of corn per year. And again, that, that, it falls in between 400, to a little over $500,000 per year. Now we put that into a 501c3, which is a nonprofit. And starting uh, four or five years ago, you can see the, uh, the picture, the first graduating class, uh, if it's still up there uh, in the black shirts, they're on a, a combine there. That was the first graduating class. And we, we give each student that graduates from Groover, the opportunity to get money to go to whatever post-secondary school they would like. So it's not limited. They can go to Harvard, Yale, they can go to John Deere tractor repair school. Uh, they can cosmetology school. Uh, we do not limit them as to where they go to, they can go in-state, they can go out-state, uh, it doesn't matter. The way the, the way it works is whenever they enroll in, in Groover, and, the, and again, the majority of them come in as freshmen, but you can come in as a senior and still accrue points. Points assist essentially equate to money, to dollars. Um, and we base the point system on two main things. Uh, participation and excellence. Those are two things that, that we want to stress uh, here at Groover. And so the, because we're small, we have students that are able to be involved in multiple activities. Again, uh, you know, when I was at 5A Caprock, 
uh, had my basketball team and, and very few would play football and basketball. So it's more difficult possibly uh, to share students, but there's also a lot more activities at bigger schools than we have here. We're limited in, in our scope of classes we can offer uh, and extracurricular as well. So uh, that, that probably is a wash there. But anyway, we encourage our students to participate in everything that they want to. Uh, academics, uh, fine arts, uh, obviously athletics, we talked about FFA, FCCLA, National Honor Society. So as they become involved and they finish the school year in that uh, program, they, they get points. Uh, you get points for just about any, anything. Uh, academics, grade point average, um, you know, not getting in trouble. You know, if you get in trouble um, X number of times, you, you, you don't get those points. Uh, SAT scores, SAT scores. Uh, you can accrue points as well. Uh, the other part of that is, is a merit-based program. So if you, the higher you score on SAT or ACT, the more points you get, uh, the better at band you are. If you advance, you accrue points that way. Uh, if you're part of a team and the team advances through the playoffs, you get points. Uh, if you are an FFA officer, you get points. So we look at, at anything that they can participate in, we give them points. As they advance, uh, if they go to UIL, you know, calculator to state, which we've had, they get points for each level that they advance. So uh, throughout the four years, they gather points. And at the end, we essentially give, we allot or disperse $1,500 per student per class. We have around 30, 35 students per class on average. And um, so each class is disbursed approximately $50,000 per semester for eight semesters. So we disperse with, with, we now have four graduating classes uh, involved in the program. So we will, um, we will disperse $400,000 per year uh, for our graduates. Uh, again, uh, they, do have to, they do have to do some things. They, they have to fill out a FAFSA. Uh, they have to enroll in a post-secondary school and then uh, they have to list all their other scholarships. But at the end of the day, they bring their bill to us. We calculate their points and we write them a personal check uh, to which they can, uh, they give to the, uh, the college or, or post-secondary, you know, uh, trade school, whatever it may be of their choice. The, uh, if you just walk the halls at Groover, you're going to get probably about 900 to a thousand dollars if you're just a, but, uh, I think the most we gave out to a, to a incoming freshman college freshman was about $3,300 for this semester. Uh, now we keep that total the same throughout the four years. One thing I have to do a better job of, we have to do a better job. It's one problem that we have throughout the, the state uh, is, is, you know, attrition, the attrition rates, uh, the, the college dropout rates. So ours, ours are better than most, but they're still not acceptable for us. We have, we have too many that that will not get their degree. Um, but on the bright side, I guess if there is a bright side, as, as students do drop out of the program, that $50,000 is still there. And so their share can get up to around $6,500 a semester by the end of it. Uh, but we don't want that to happen. We, we want everybody to stay in. We want everybody to, to, to get their degree or their certificate. And really one of the, the, the reasoning reasons behind this is we wanted to come back to Groover and raise their family here. Uh, I grew up in a very small town and this town I grew up in, it's kind of drying up as you've seen a lot of communities. Groover is unique in that we have a lot of young families moving back to Groover to raise their kids. 
And that was one of the reasons behind this. Obviously, another reason, if you look at state, uh, the state of Texas and uh, college debt, it's around $27,000, $28,000 per student. We want to help alleviate that. You know, that's a national crisis uh, is, is debt and college debt. So um, we want to try to try to help alleviate that. And, uh, and so we, we have to some degree uh, assisted in that. So, you know, you look at $4,000, uh, $3,000 a semester, you know, kids can get 6,000 times four, 20, 20, thousand dollars for four years. And that, you know, that doesn't pay for everything, but it helps significantly a added on to the other scholarships, FAFSA and things like that. Uh, and again, it's last money in, so it'll pay for, you know, books, it'll pay for cafeteria, it'll pay for, we don't designate it to just tuition and fees. Uh, one of the problems, good problems we ran into, we had some students, some first generation students, never, they were the first ones in their family to ever graduate college. Well, they graduated in six years. So we said, well, we're, we're, we're gonna help pay for their master's degree too. So it's a full eight semesters. If you graduate early and, and you, you have to maintain a 2.75 GPA, and you have to be considered a full-time student. Um, but, you know, in the master's program, six hours could be full-time. So we definitely want to help, and we have helped students uh, achieve their master's degree as well. And again, it's really neat when, you, when it's first-generation students. Uh, the last thing, and, and then I'll quit talking, uh, we, we we still have quite a bit of money, which is a great problem to have. So we think, what else can we do? So one of the things that we've been able to do, like everybody else, you know, we want to improve our uh, our uh, our college credit, and uh, so we have a good relationship with Frank Phillips, a local junior college. But but nobody's better than our own teachers for our students. So we thought, well, let's help get our teachers, master's degrees. So we now have added just last year opportunities for our own teachers. If they choose to get a master's degree, we will help pay for that uh, master's degree. Uh, and there's some stipulations. They need to be here three years. It needs to be in an area that we could possibly use, uh, even if it's not necessarily something we have now, but if, if they can sell it, and, and we think, yeah, if we have the opportunity, we, we will do that, then we will pay that, uh, we will help pay for their master's degree. So uh, that's, that's, that's an extra thing that, that I'm really excited about as well. So that's the farm scholarship, uh, but there's things, you know, other small schools, they may not have land, but maybe there's opportunity to have, uh, you know, a, a ranch, you know, get a herd of cattle. Maybe, maybe it's businesses. And I don't know, again, like Coach Arms said, every, every situation is unique. Uh, we're blessed to have that land donated. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And we're grateful for it. But whatever you have, look to use it uh, for the betterment of your students. Uh, you know, find your gift and then give that gift away. A gift is no good if, if, if you keep it. You know, gift, gifts are forgiving. And that's what our community has done. Uh, and it's really neat. Generally, we at the harvest, we'll have a big hot dog roast and we'll take kids out there and we'll have demonstrations. You'll see the kids, you know, run around the corn. Uh, they get to climb all over the combines. Of course, they're off and, you know, it's safe. But uh, this year we're unable to do that. But uh, it's a great community event. And uh, we are blessed to, to be able to do it. So if you have questions, holler. Uh, again, my name's Wade Callaway, and uh, I love talking about it. And you can find me on the web. Uh, so just reach out to me, and I would love to, to visit with you about it. And I believe that's all I have. So, Coach Arms, at this time, I will turn it back to you. You're doing great, by the way. Keep it up. Well, thanks, Coach. Appreciate you. And again, if you have questions, I know that we're kind of running low on time, so uh, we're happy to answer these. We also have information on our website as well and uh, this is a snippet from this from our website so um you'll be able to find out more information but again just keep it you know start small uh we do have business relationships that um you know our local restaurant 
the El Vaquero, we, we don't have very many restaurants in Groover, but we do have a couple. And uh, one of them has a night to where they offer um, you know, pizza night, pizza night, and all the proceeds from those pizzas go go towards Groover uh, ISD or go towards a specific uh, class. So we have fun. You know, we, we don't really look at it as fundraising. It's actually the the business itself that took the initiative to do that. Um, but it is money going back towards the school. And so creating those business relationships, you know, starting small, you don't have to create a huge scholarship just yet, but start small and reach out to those local businesses or maybe those, those companies that your parents, the parents of your students work for um, because those parents want to be involved, the businesses want to be involved. So I'm going to kind of roll, roll through this, um, the remaining section of this. Again, I know we're running low on time and I just appreciate you guys so much for, for being a part of this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about face-to-face -face, uh, parent communication and when it comes to education and, and putting out things that will help educate the parents. So kind of getting away from our event side of things of, of involving community, but how do you get parents, you know, how do you communicate with them? How do you get them to engage? And some of the things that we do obviously are some traditional things like our uh, Title I parent meetings. We have GT and ESL meetings. Um, we also have, uh, you know, educational assemblies and, and meetings to where um, they they can learn things. And an example is we just had one this past week that was called the dangers of social media. Um, I'm a parent and I uh, was a part of that and it was terrifying. I encourage all of you to learn the dangers of social media. Um, but uh, that was something that was pretty neat that we were able to offer uh, parents to come in in person. We did host this in our high school gym that gave us plenty of room for people to social distance. They were able to wear their masks. Uh, again, you don't have to cancel these events just because of COVID um, unless your, your particular county or has other restrictions, but um, modify. If you can't be in person, you know, stream it on a live Facebook live or stream something uh, on a YouTube live. There are ways to put to record videos and, and be able to send those out to parents. So you have to put the information in front of them to get, to get them to, to listen and want to be engaged. You can create incentives to get in the door. We had one event where we uh, gave away long lunch um, to high school students if their parents showed up. Um, I'm not, I'm not against, I'm a parent of, of young kids. Uh, so I'm not against bribery, uh, you know, in, in a funny sense. So sometimes you, you have to dangle, you have to dangle the carrot to get somebody to walk through the door um, and to get someone to put, because once they get the information in front of them, they are grateful for it and they're glad that they showed up. Another, uh, another good thing that we do here that I think is really neat at the high school level is we have what's called an application night where we have, um, some of our parents schedule in now, again, because of COVID, we've made the adjustment where we have to schedule it in groups, uh, but we have our high school counselor on hand in one of our computer labs and parents are able to come in and fill out college uh, like FAFSA forms and things like that because some parents, they don't know how to do it. They, they struggle with that. And so being able to offer that outlet of, of a hands-on experience where we can show them how to fill that out, they really do appreciate that and they wanna show up for that. Um, again, the traditional, the traditional approach that we use here um, with communication is phone calls. I don't care how good uh, your social media looks. I don't care how well your email is written. Um, I don't care what kind of how big of carrot you dangle. <laughs> it, it's not going to get everyone in the door. And if you need to really communicate something important or you need to really grasp that relationship, you have to pick up the phone. Uh, and sometimes that takes a team. Sometimes that takes delegating, uh, you know, numbers to each individual. I, I know during quarantine, we had um, our counselors, our aides, our teachers, there were designated certain groups that we made the phone calls to follow up. Uh, we walked parents through how to use Google Classroom on the phone. Um, so again, you don't get away from that, that personal relationship, even though we have some amazing tools at our fingertips to communicate, um, don't get away from the phone calls. And so you see a picture of a cast net. Um, I am a, a past a fisherman. There's not a whole lot of fishing in Groover, America, um, but uh, I, I tend to look at things through a, a, a fishing lens sometimes too. So that cast net is something that we really keep that mentality here. 
uh, you have to throw the cast net when it comes to communication. You have to use all of it. You can't just use the phone call. You can't just use the texting or the social media or the Google platform. All of the things that I have listed here are things that we implement, um, but you can't just use one because there's gonna be a parent or, or a family or a community member that, that falls between those cracks that maybe doesn't know how to use one of those, those items. Maybe they're scared of technology. Um, but in this day and age, everyone has a phone. Uh, so for the most part, so we, we also have actually done house calls as well. We've actually gone out and showed up at the house to communicate with a parent. So do what you have to do, um, but you do have to do all of it, which is where that team mentality comes in place as far as delegating those things out. Um, something that is a, a little bit unique, what we do here that I have found to be a hit, um, and this is where I'm going to kind of uh, maybe show my technological um, side of how of things, but I have created what's called a Greyhound Happenings newsletter. And, and you know, you may be thinking to yourself, well, we already do a newsletter. And I think that that's great. Um, now, how do you, how are you utilizing your newsletter? How are you distributing that newsletter out to, to put it in front of people? And what kind of avenue are you taking um, to create that newsletter? And so uh, again, how I do it may, may not be exactly how you want to do it, but this is what has really worked worked really well for us. Um, it, does, it does connect those parents and the community because it is an all-inclusive newsletter that we put out weekly to bi-weekly. Um, we try to put it out weekly, but there are some weeks that you know we do have things that um, there's just not a whole lot going on in the sense of putting together a complete newsletter. So it's, it will go out bi-weekly. Um, but because we're throwing that cast net of utilizing our website, use, utilizing eNote text, which I'll touch on here in a second, um, the communication is, is still going out. So we just have an all-inclusive place of our newsletter um, that is kind of that traditional sense. So I'm going to uh, show you just a couple examples really quick on how that we use this. And let me get to here real fast. Okay, so uh, if I can get a nod of a head that you can see one of our newsletters. Awesome, thank you for your interaction. <laughs> and so we, we have a newsletter here. This is just an example of one of the newsletters we put together. And, and I, I did kind of put it in a, in a newspaper format. Um, again, we, I wanna to appeal to that older generation that misses picking up that, that Sunday morning newspaper and scrolling through and seeing the news. Um, you don't see that anymore. So I kind of wanted to have that feel of this. I did create this with just Word, uh, just a Word, you know, Word document, I created myself a template um, that is very simple that I can just replace, replace information. Again, use what you know how to use. I know learning curves sometimes uh, are, are scary, um, but, but go ahead and you can branch out if you want. And, and but, but if you already found an avenue that works for you, then rock on with it. But this is just gonna show kind of, it's gonna show our events. We had a, a really cool event with the high school um, involving the community. It was called a Night of the Arts. Um, this was something that we did last year for the first time. It was a huge hit where we had our, our new theater department had a play and we uh, had what's a dinner, a dinner and a show. So our FCCLA culinary arts group actually cooked cakes and desserts. We had food donated in um, for to, to serve dinner. And then our art department had a had an art auction that went towards fundraising. So our community members came in and they, you know, did a silent auction on the art that was created by high school students. They were able to have dinner and they were able to then go to a, to a theater show. It was a huge success, a huge turnout. I think we actually, they sold tickets because we had limited seating and it sold out. Uh, so that was really an exciting thing. You don't get a whole lot of uh, dinner and shows here in Groover. So offering something like that, that people could feel like maybe they're at, you know, they're at Broadway and be able to, to see a show with dinner in this sense. And so we were, again, we promoted this um, and, and showing the kids art. And so after, the, after that was over, I then featured this in the newsletter. I'm gonna feature things going on in the classroom. These are little projects done in the math class in the junior high. I'm gonna feature sports. I'm gonna feature the community service. I'm gonna feature any field trip that went on with the elementary. Um, you know, of course, we're gonna have a sports page and touch on the sports. And then if we have any leftover pictures from, from that week, uh, this sometimes we do and sometimes we don't, but I'm going to create a photo gallery because people like to see pictures. Again, this is where your yearbook staff is really going to come in play here. So you're not walking around snapping a gajillion pictures. 
Um, also to the left, that was fun as we do a staff a questionnaire. They're fun, little fun questions like what's your favorite food? Who's your celebrity crush? Um, this kind of, you know, it gets people to, to meet our staff at a personal level. And also um, the kids like to read these newspapers as well. Um, I'm going to click over here and show you another one that this is a more recent one. And this is where we have started implementing Bitly links. If you're not familiar with Bitly, um, that they are just a short condensed version of websites and flyers. Um, they are very Google friendly. So we use a Google platform here and, and, and the things that we do. Um, there are other options out there. All you have to do is research it, but it's easy to click on a short Bitly link. Um, so anything that was sent out that week uh, to, to communications through text, through our parents and community, I included this in our newsletter as well. Um, these were actually open house announcements. So what these are clickable links um, where this, this document is sent out like a PDF. It is sent out as a PDF through our texting system. It's also posted on our website. And then people can then open this up from their phone or from their computer, from their email, and they're able to then click this bit.ly link that will then take them to the flyer. So uh, our internet might be running a little slow right now, but I'm not gonna wait very long on it. So um, I'll go ahead and close that out. But anyway, it's just a very, it's a quick way to put the material in front of people. So then they're able to see, um, you know, see that in front of them. Maybe they missed the text that week. Maybe they just didn't get to see it. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation again. Okay. So here, so now we're going to roll a little bit into technology. Um, you know, how we're utilizing our technology. Now, you're going to have people that they feel like they're scared of it. They're scared of how to how to use that. And, and I hate to break it to you, um, but it's here whether you like it or not. And so that's that's a that's a tough love coach coming out in me. Um, so if you're scared of technology, what I encourage you to do is just dive in. The more you use something, the more you're going to be comfortable with it. It's not, a, it's not a big scary monster as it seems. Start small and work your way up from there because technology is the direction that we're going. This is how we, this is how we operate. And you're going to have as these students, and like Mr. Calloway said, we're encouraging these kids to, to go get educations, but like maybe come back to Groover and raise your family. This generation that we're raising right now, they are tech, technology geniuses. So if we don't teach ourselves how to communicate that way, we're going to be left behind. Okay, so what I what I recommend and what really works here is Google. We, we really enjoy Google, the applications and, and the entire platform uh, that rolls into Google. It, it actually ties into our website. Um, it ties into how our, our teachers communicate during quarantines. We utilize Google Classroom. Um, we utilize Google Forms when it comes to doing parent surveys. They're extremely simple to create. Um, you know, the, all of the different apps that you can use that, that, are, that are all inclusive in Google, they're very, very user friendly. So when it comes to that te technology curve, I do encourage uh, user friendliness in this. Um, this is just a little glimpse of the technology that we use. We do have a central funnel of our website. And so we, we drive everyone to our website, whether it is our uh, parents, whether it is our students, whether it's our community, our staff, we even have staff links on our website. If you can create that consistency in that one-stop shop, people start to get a little bit more comfortable with that. So this is our website here. This is kind of a glimpse of the things that we use in our different apps. Um, I actually had plans on showing you some some clicks, but because we're kind of running low on time, I'm gonna skip over that. So I do invite you to go visit our website, click around, see how user-friendly that it is. Um, you know, and because less is more. I know sometimes people can get really excited about the graphics, about uh, the art, about, you know, the, the excitement of the website, but I will tell you that less is more. Um, make it simple, make it easy to navigate, um, and, and there's tons of information out there on, on the web about how you can do that. And if you have questions for us, of course, we're always available to, to tell you. So I'm about to roll to show you a little bit about our eNotes because our eNotes, as you see down here to the left, this is a feature that, that comes with our website platform. Um, we actually use Gabbert uh, for our website. Um, if you have a website that you're using and you love, great. Um, we have found that this has been very user friendly for our platform and what these eNotes are is they're actually integrated into our website platform and we're able to send out mass texts 
to our community members and to our parents if they're signed up for those groups. So we do a huge push uh, of signing up for these e-notes. Everything from weather closings to school delays from sports results, um, we're able to then create um, you know, the subgroups. And I'm gonna bring on uh, Holly McLean just very, very quickly to, to kind of to, to talk about that just a little bit because I want you to see the simplicity behind this because you don't have to be an IT person um, to be able to send out one of these texts and do this. So I, I want you, even though uh, if you're scared of technology, I want you to really grasp onto this and know that this is okay. You can do this, I promise. Um, but this has been a very, very effective way of how we communicate with our parents. We send out everything through these e-notes and through these texts, because like I said before, everybody has a phone attached to their hand. So if you can use the phone, then you're gonna be able to communicate with them. So. Um, uh, let me look at my time. I know that we're kind of, again, we're running, we're running out on time. So uh, Holly, if, if you don't mind jumping on real quick, I just want you to show just the back side of this real fast and then uh, we'll kind of close up. No, that's fine. I'm just going, I just wanted to highlight um, our parent page. So up at our top at our main navigation, we have a spot just for parents again, kind of funneling them to one place. And so on there, we have resources. We try to focus on some photos and then some clickable links about some information that those parents might need on hand. Um, at the bottom, here's a place again where you can just sign up for those e-notes. We also have the older generation that might not be comfortable signing up through this platform. So during open house, we even gave them a paper form and said, if you will fill this out, we'll do the back end stuff. We'll make sure that that information comes directly to you because we found that more parents like it coming directly to them than having to go and search for it. Um, on the back end, and we have a very easy platform to uh, navigate our eNote system right here. But what it looks like on the, t on the um, back side is we have several lists. And so we, we do a naming scheme by graduation year. So it's easy to transition and move that up instead of kindergarten, then it's always that group that we send it to and we can add and remove users from that. We have one just for staff information. We had internet outages last or earlier this week. And so it was really easy just to send a text to those teachers since I couldn't email them. But the, the main thing I wanna show you is just the ease. Um, once you have your subscribers in that group, you can add them manually. The key again is communicating in that native language. And so it's very easy if I manually put in a teacher, I, or excuse me, a parent or community member, I can hit Spanish. And then from the actual um, message that I'm sending a particular parent, If it's text, all I have to do is check this box right here and using Google, the Google platform again that we keep promoting um, as, as far as ease of use, I click that box and Google Translate will translate whatever text I put in there um, directly into that language for those parents. We also can send out emails. Again, I utilize the bit.ly link as well as far as getting that communication out and especially when I'm limited on the number of characters that I can use. Um, the bit.ly really helps. So if there's a the newsletter or if it's a video that are um, that kind of highlights what our kids are doing or that those flyers, we put it out in there. So it's just a little, so we can put more content within those. Um, I work closely with the teachers. If they want something sent out, um, they fill out a short Google form, and then from that request, then I can put those messages in there, and it makes it very easy for, again, our team, whoever sees this first, to be able to just push that out onto whatever platform they want. And so they can choose, do you want to email, do you want it text, Twitter, Facebook, web page, you name it, and we are able to, with one platform with our web page, put that out in all those directions. So I'm going to turn it back over to um, Neely to give you more information and wrap things up. Okay, thank you, Holly. And I didn't really properly introduce Miss Holly. She is our Mrs. McLean, our uh, technology director here of technology and instruction. So, um, Holly, if you'll if you'll stop sharing your screen, yes, I'm so sorry. I will. Ma'am, here we go. And so we're going to wrap things up, kind of right here. And let's see. All right. 
So can you, you guys can see my screen, correct? Yes, great. Thank you again for your interaction. It's kind of odd sitting in a room by yourself. So, um, so anyway, just want to touch very quickly. We're running out of time. And I want to answer all of your questions uh, very quickly on kind of COVID adjustments and what we've done differently. I did see a question pop up that I do want to touch on as far as uh, translation accuracy. Um, everything that we do, yes, we do translate. Uh, and we have, we have several um, translators on staff that we, we proof everything through. And so when it comes to uh, translating our text, um, we do try to keep our text very simple and to the point. So that translation is accurate. And then we will, uh, if time allows, if it's not a, an emergency, then we do um, run that through our translators just to make sure everything looks, looks correct uh, when it comes to putting out basically anything, whether it's a flyer or an announcement. So everything we do is bilingual. Um, and we do have that, that option on our website to where you can go to the very bottom of our website and choose your native language. And it will then uh, convert our website into your native language, which is pretty, pretty handy. So again, COVID adjustments very quickly. Um, we had an all hands on deck mentality. We still do um, delegating those responsibilities, uh, but not getting away from that interpersonal uh, relationship with people and that communication. Um, you know, the events that we had to do, whether we're home, uh, and not in school, we still want to have those events. So how do you do that? Well, maybe you do a drive by, maybe you invite the kids to sit in their cars on Main Street while the teachers, you know, hold up birthday signs, you know, and again, we up to the left, we feature newsletters of what's going on in the kids worlds of virtually. So that's something that we still send out during all of this time. Um, having a having the teachers do drive-bys uh, just, just for the fun of it. We've organized those because it, it continues to feed into those relationships. Uh, to date, we still use, um, for our adjustments, we're using Facebook Live, uh, we're using YouTube, um, and you know, we're using these outlets to be able to, to put this information out if, if parents or, or community members can't be there. So what I want you to understand with that though is, you know, be careful, I will, I will kind of throw a flag of caution um, when it comes to utilizing Facebook Live, when it comes to utilizing anything that's live, um, making sure that the people in charge of that understand it's live so nothing inappropriate flashes across. And also there are kids that are gonna have um, media restrictions where there, maybe their parents did, you know, didn't want them uh, to have, you know, their face shown to the public, you know, via media or pictures. So check with your local campuses, make sure that you have a list of those kids that, that have media restrictions. And, um, and so a simple way to do that, I know we had, a, we had an instance like that with our Halloween uh, parade of costumes, and we're having a Facebook Live, and we, we know the kid, and so we just simply put our hand in front of the screen uh, to block the view while the kid passed by, and then we put it back down. So um, just be fluid in this, and, and all you can do is the best you can do. So um, again, uh, Skip, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I'm sorry we went a little over. And I would love to answer any questions and invite you to visit our website when you have time, if you uh, want to just kind of snoop around and see kind of more of how we do things. Thank you so much, Neely. Gosh, you guys are doing great work and I appreciate so much you taking the time to meet with us this morning. Lots of positive comments on the chat room, but also some good questions. If we don't get to all of the questions, if it's okay with you, Neely, we will send you those questions get your answers, then we will post those answers where we post the recording of the event. Um, some good questions, but again, job well done. You know, it's often hard to do things that are rural districts in some ways, other ways it's easier, but it's it has its challenges just like the urban and suburban areas do. But you guys are doing great work. The first question that we wanna ask is, how do you show appreciation to your business partners? So that is a great question. Um, I, so here comes my marketing spill again, uh, because it is it is a relationship, and you know you do promote. And even though when you have a business that that wants to give back or, or be charitable, um, it does look good. I mean, we're just going to call it the elephant in the room. It does look good on their resume that they have they're giving to charity or they're able to advertise that they're a part of that that scholarship. So we do our part in in giving credit where credits due. Um, we're all we're going to be putting that, you know, in a text, in a newsletter, um, you know, sponsored by 
the local restaurant. Um, these businesses are contributing back. We're going to have a list of those businesses just to give them that recognition um, and encourage people to go do business with them because this is a business relationship. And so you, it ha it's a two-way street. So you have to just give credit where credit's due. Um, and sometimes that means showing up with a, a gift basket from that particular sports team um, on their doorstep. Great. Another question is, um, do you have an elementary bilingual or ESL program? Yes, we do. Um, we actually have a, uh, on each campus, elementary, junior high and high school. And so, um, yeah, so we, because of our demographics, um, we, that is a, a, a huge deal here. And so there is a lot of focus and, and emphasis on um, our ESL and, and bilingual uh, programs as well as our translations when it comes into communicating with parents, uh, families, and of course the community. Perfect, thank you. Before I ask the next question, I wanna remind everybody that we will have a second session that begins at 1015. So don't leave us just yet. We'll give you a break and you'll be in good shape. Okay, Neely, do you use local or federal funds to pay for PFE activities or is it all paid for through community donations? So it's a great question. Um, like you said before, there's just not a whole lot of, of money allotted um, for our smaller school districts. Um, so this is where the, the partnerships come in play. So I would say yes to all of those. Um, there, there's a little bit uh, pulled from everywhere to be able to pay for these items. Again, um, because we live in a community that is so giving, um, they wanna give, they wanna be involved. Uh, there is a lot of money that is donated in there, are, you know, whether it's money or whether it's food or whether it's services, um, these things are, are donated in. And then we do uh, use, of course, our, you know, local money um, for that as well. So making sure that businesses want to want to give, but you have to you have to open that door. You have to let them know that you're you're open to building a relationship with them. Know that it's wanted and needed and how that can be beneficial to both parties. Has to be a win win, doesn't it? Has to be. Um, a, a question that was just added is how diverse is your campus concerning cultural background? If I remember right, you said about 49, about 50-50 really between white and Hispanic and 2% other. Is that, do I remember that correctly? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. We're, we're, I mean, I just, for sake of simplicity, I like to say 50-50. Um, it, you know, it's very 50-50 when it comes to, to diversity and, uh, you know, and we do have some and we say culture, I think our demographics of ethnicity, ethnicity can be a little different from maybe cultural backgrounds sometimes. Um, so we do kind of have a wide range there, um, but we are, we are very sensitive to our demographics as far as our numbers. And when we have new families move in and, or, or move out, um, we do pay attention to that and how we communicate and being very sensitive. Again, you're throwing the cast net. So you don't want anyone to fall, to fall between the cracks, including people of different you know, ethnicities or cultural backgrounds. Um, do y'all have a large number of migrant students? Um, we, we, we have a, yes, we have a percentage of my, yes, migrant students. I was thinking I remembered that, that you yes. did. Um, another question is, is your newsletter printed out or is it shared on social media or both? So it is actually, um, it is, we try to keep it virtual as much as we can utilizing the PDF. That's why we always save it as a PDF because that is user-friendly across all platforms. Um, so we will send that out via text. On, we'll post it on the website. We uh, send it out through email utilizing those e-notes. Um, I also will print one off and put it in each campus. And then we can also print it off and hang it up in our local post office. So we have a, a very small uh, post office as well. Um, and I've, I've had a lot of great feedback and what I've had from especially our older generations is they love it and what they do is they once they get it in the email, they print it off themselves if they have access to a printer. And so um, they'll print it off because they want to hold it in their hands and then if I ever get requests from people to print off, uh, we do print off as needed. It's just to save paper, we don't just distribute a newspaper. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, one more question. Do you have established, you addressed a little bit about when needed you go into the home, but do you have established plan home visits? Uh, we do have established plan home visits. Um, these are a little bit unique to the campus um, and our admin uh, and our counselors are um, kind of, they're driving the boat there and that's usually who is showing up um, you know, our counselors for, for those home visits, but there is a plan in place. Again, um, I encourage you to just visit with your administration, uh, visit with your special POPs programs, 
and um, you know all the different programs in place there on your campus. Put your brains together to see what works best for you, and then yes, absolutely get get a plan uh, put in place. Thank you, Neely. One thing I want to talk about real quickly is the translation, and somebody had mentioned for accuracy that is so important. But I'm going to quote what Corey Green from the Texas Education Agency has said on multiple. Um, moments of time that he presents at ACIT and other <clears throat> events. He talks about that accuracy is important, but it's not the end all be all. What's important is that you get the information out. So if you notice, she talked about Google Translate. We know that Google Translate's not perfect, uh -oh. but, oh. Okay, I think I was fro, I'm still, still frozen. Still frozen. Yeah, Sorry about that. We had a, something go terribly wrong, but I think we're all back in. One of the things I want to quickly say again about the translations is it's just important that you try to get the word out. It's not imperative that it's 100% accurate. Parents just appreciate the effort. Now, granted, if it's a written document, if it's a formal document the school is sending out, just like Neely said, you need to make sure that that is very carefully worded and it's, and it's, um, written with accuracy, but if it's something that's on your website and you use that Google Translate, that is the best effort that you can do. And it, as the law says, it's to the extent practicable. So parents just appreciate the fact that you're trying. So again, job well done. Um, Groover ISD, you guys are doing stellar work there, and we so appreciate you taking the time to meet with all of us. We're going to give you a break, and at 10.15, we will begin with Taylor ISD. You don't want to miss that presentation. I know John Matthews well, and I can tell you they're doing great work, and you're going to want to hear. Let's give a, another wave to Groover ISD and say job well done. So appreciate it so much. Um, see you guys back at 10.15.